first of all, thank you for that very friendly introduction. Um, I'm very grateful. I'm also very grateful to be invited to come to Denmark. I still belong to that really ancient school of Scandinavians who think it's strange to speak English in Denmark. But uh, now we speak English to one another in Norway, so um, I'm sure you do that in Danish universities too, that you're supposedly teaching in English everywhere. Now, is this microphone, uh, can you hear me all the way back? Right. Um, so I did have a handout. Unfortunately, um, nobody told me that this was a paper-free conference, so I could possibly have made an overhead. But the handout is not crucial. It's simply I send it out because I find that it's easier for people to follow my talk if there are some of the quotations and the references are on the handout. However, this handout, so if you don't have it, don't worry, it's not a big deal. And you can find it on the website when you go home or something. Uh, but on this handout, there is a, a little present to you all, which is that since I'm talking about intersectionality at the end of the talk, I made a mind map one day. I do do, uh, I do, do technology occasionally, but I mean, I made a mind map map of Beverly Crenshaw's foundational essay on intersectionality that I suppose I, when I teach it, I suppose you all teach it. And so if you ever need it for your teaching, I'm, I'm not referring to it in my talk, I just thought if you want it, there it is. It's the last page on the PDF and you can just cut it out of the PDF and use it. So that's my present to you all. Um, so anyway, this talk, I've changed my title a little. It's called Thinking as a Feminist, What Ordinary Language Philosophy Can Do for Feminist Theory. Um, I'm going to have to say I don't fully realize, uh, no, I do realize that I haven't fully thanked all the organizers for inviting me, but now I'm hereby thanking them. That is a performative, I think. Um, so uh, ordinary language philosophy, what is that? Um, on my definition, th there's a lot of discussion about, you know, does it have to mean whatever they did in Oxford in the 1950s and all, all such things. And I'm not going to go there. I'm just going to say that for me, it means the philosophical tradition after Wittgenstein and J.L. Austin as established and extended by Stanley Cavell. That means that the reading of Wittgenstein that I engage in is a Cavellian inspired reading. It's not, there are all kinds of other ways of doing Wittgenstein. I don't do those, just, that's just to clarify. <clears throat> In this paper, I, do, I argue that ordinary language philosophy offers feminist theorists a transformation of outlook, what Austin calls a revolution in philosophy. Now, why does feminist theory need a revolution? Well, because so much of our work, and particularly our theoretical work, has become increasingly removed from the very raison d'être of feminist work, namely the wish to understand women's experiences in a sexist world so as to help change that world. However, that sounds terribly unfair. I mean, that's after all why every feminist theorist does feminist theory, and I, I do know that. The problem isn't that we have forgotten this noble aim, the problem is that so much theory today has become appallingly abstract and overgeneralizing in ways that render it unable to say something significant about women's lives and experiences. At first blush, ordinary language philosophy is not a promising starting point for someone interested in doing feminist theory. This philosophy does not offer a theory of sex or gender or sexuality. Nor does it claim that power is, it, is an intrinsic part of language as such. It, one of the reasons it doesn't say that is that it doesn't have a concept of language as such. One of the implications is that there can be no theory of language as such. And if there can be no theory of language as such, you can't have a theory that power is always a part of language as such, because you don't have that sort of theory anymore. While, it, while this philosophy does have things to say about what it means to be an embodied creature sharing a world with others, it tends to connect the body to the soul, and many feminists would scoff at the very notion that they should take an interest in something called the soul. I'm thinking of Wittgenstein's, the human body is the best picture of the human soul. 
Ordinary language philosophy, moreover, has nothing to say about the gendered organization of society. There is nothing in Wittgenstein, Austin, or Cavell about the experience of being a woman in the world. There is not even that much about women. The major exception from this rule is Cavell's discussion of female characters in his essays on film and theater, but they, those essays have been heavily criticized by some feminists. So in short, it may seem perverse to insist, as I do, that ordinary language philosophy nevertheless offers feminism a revolution in theory. It does so in many different ways. And in this paper, I can only focus on one major claim, namely that ordinary language philosophy challenges the, what I want to call the theory project that has dominated much of the humanities since the 1970s. In so doing, it clears the ground for ways of thinking that are more attentive to particulars, to individual experience, more attuned to the ways we actually use language, more open to the questions thrown up by actual human lives than the standard attempts to do theory. Now, I, here I have to say something crucial. The point is not, I mean, this, I, I hope, you will see by the end of the paper why I say this now. The point is not here to come along with Wittgenstein, Cavell, and Austin and say, now we will apply this to feminist questions. We are not going to be able to apply anything directly to anything. The point of doing, <laughs> the point, you see, the thing is, if we get where I want to go, then we don't have to go back and read Wittgenstein and Cavell and Austin necessarily. We will just feel free from a kind of theoretical picture of what we must do. The reason why I am reading Wittgenstein, Austin and Cavell is that it provides me with an intellectually reputable and serious way of undoing certain moves that I think we have taken for granted and take as obligatory. And there are certain things that we in feminist theory think we can't say. Authenticity, experience, for example. Just think of the bad press they've had. Well, one of the reasons I, I read this stuff is that it actually gives me a philosophically serious ways of reclaiming those terms in ways that aren't uh, objectionable to me anyway. But I can't do all that theory here. But if you sit there at the end asking yourself, well, what does Wittgenstein say that I can use in my research? The answer is probably nothing. That's not the level at which I'm, I'm doing this. So let's see now. Before I begin, I need, of course, to say one more thing. Um, I'm speaking from a philosophical tradition that's not yet well known in women and gender studies. Although I've worked very hard to make this talk as accessible as possible, I simply can't explain all this philosophy at the same time as I discuss feminist theory. For this reason, misunderstandings are particularly likely to arise. All I can do is to ask you to listen with what Freud called evenly suspended attention, by which he meant, I think, that one shouldn't leap to conclusions. So the first section is called, uh, on the handout, you have the overview of sections, for example, and some quotes and stuff. To think as a feminist, making women's experience intelligible. Oh, yes, and another footnote. This may last a little longer than my 45 minutes. But I'm very happy to discuss with you all in the break afterwards forever and ever. Um, let me begin at the beginning. What is feminist theory? But here already the word theory pulls me up. It already carries so much baggage. Let me change the term. Instead of talking about feminist theory, I'll talk about feminist thinking. May, and I'm saying thinking and not thought, because thought sounds as if it's already done, whereas thinking is maybe more ongoing. Maybe that will allow us to consider the question afresh. What does it mean to think as a feminist? The philosopher Marilyn Fry writes that feminist thinking begins with a commitment to making the experiences and lives of women intelligible. Her clear and unpretentious voice makes the point with admirable power. I'm quoting Marilyn Fry. One of the great powers of feminism is that it goes so far in making the experiences and lives of women intelligible. 
trying to make sense of one's own feelings, motivations, desires, ambitions, actions and reactions without taking into account the forces which maintain the subordination of women to men is like trying to explain why a marble stops rolling without taking friction into account. What feminist theory is about to a great extent is just identifying those forces or some range of them or kinds of them and displaying the mechanics of their applications to women as a group or case and to individual women. The measure of the success of the theory is just how much sense it makes of what did not make sense before. 